that's the most important thing to me as, as a CEO is to have people believe in what you've set. You can set strategic goals, set, set out your five-year plan and your 10-year plan. And if nobody believes in what you believe in, it won't happen and you won't make it. So I think that's one of the biggest learnings for me in, in coming into this role was how to manage this diverse team of franchisees and how to bring everybody to a common agenda. Welcome to episode 18 of the Food Grads podcast, the podcast where we explore careers in the food, beverage, and hospitality industries. I'm your host, Veronica Hislop, a molecular science graduate student and career partner with Food Grads. On this week's podcast, I interview Trish Patterson, the CEO of Copper Branch. Copper Branch is a 100% plant-based quick-serve restaurant chain with a mission to empower, energize, and make people feel their best. Established in Montreal, Canada, they have locations across Canada and recently have expanded to Nashville and soon to be France. In this episode, Trish and I talked about Copper Branch and its philosophy on food and how the company prides itself on sourcing 100% plant-based and sustainable ingredients. We dive into how Trish started in this industry as a franchise owner after working in a corporate setting. I learned about what exactly a CEO and a franchisee owner does for their job and what young people should do if they want to move up the ranks in this industry. Overall, Trisha's career is a fascinating one and shows that you can really reinvent yourself if you just give it a try. Trish really advocates the idea of saying yes to new opportunities because you never know where it'll take you. This conversation just got me so excited about the plant-based food sector and where it's going. With that, on to the show. Thank you so much, Trish, for coming on the show. I'm excited that Anjali was able to connect us. This is going to be my first time talking to a CEO. So thank you for being on the show, Trish. Oh, thank you for having me. I want to get into learning more about what your company is doing, because I think that it is such a timely type restaurant fast serve that we need to see more of in particularly in the area that I live in. But for those who might not know, could you tell me a little bit more about Copper Branch Foods and their philosophy? Copper Branch, so we're, we're 100% plant-based, which is exciting. Categorized as fast casual, so kind of in the quick serve category. We have stores right across Canada, Alberta, Ontario, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, BC, and Quebec. We have started our international expansion into France with five stores in France and Belgium. We have two stores in the U.S., one in Portland, Maine, and one that just opened a couple of weeks ago in Nashville, Tennessee. So we are taking the world by storm, and really, we're about bringing a whole food plant-based diet. So how do we bring an alternative, a delicious food to people that are looking for something quickly? Better version of fast food is kind of our, our mission here. We're thrilled to bring these stores to downtown cores, but we also have a lot of stores in our suburb centers, which on some of the outlying cities like, like Durham region, where stores are, you know, a lot of times people have to go downtown into big cities to get this type of food. So we're really trying to bring it en masse to people across various different communities. And I think that's really exciting too, as well, especially you mentioned suburbs, because I mean, plant-based is definitely becoming mainstream now, which is great in its own right. But having it accessible in suburbs, as someone who's grown up in a suburb, I've found it these types of places are more designated for, let's just say, cities. For example, like I go into Toronto. So to hear that you guys are expanding not only worldwide, but in the suburbs is great because I think that we need more alternatives to, you know, I, I'm not going to lie, I do love McDonald's and that, but <laughs> sometimes... I just want to eat something healthy and I just didn't have the time to make it. And I don't want to go crazy out of my way to go find something. Yeah. And I mean, we're really, if you look at our menu, we've got a great variety of comfort food too, from vegan poutine and burgers down to, you know, the healthier side of whole food power bowls. And that's what we're really trying to do is not just hone in on plant-based people, but to really appeal to everybody. Like you said, if you just feel one day a week, like that healthier option, there's a place to go. It's cool as well that you mentioned comfort food because I feel as though with plant-based foods, I know that you've encouraged having the healthy eating, but as well, having those comfort foods, sometimes, again, you want to indulge, but not over the top with 
with everything, for example, like cheese curds and all those types of things. So to have a plant-based alternative that you can have great tasting food that both, you know, your vegan friend and yourself enjoy, well, myself, I should say, is great. <laughs> awesome. That leaves me to wanting to learn more about you because I was doing a lot of research on you prior to this episode and learning about your story. And I think that it's a really interesting one considering that you weren't an individual who maybe started off at this company, you know, as a high teenager and then worked their way up. But instead, you weren't actually in the restaurant industry, but instead you had worked at Hewitt Packard. And I would love if you could maybe talk about your story and how you went from your former career path to where you are today. Sure. Uh, my career path is not really a linear one by any means. And it, it's kind of, in many ways, it's it's by chance and opportunity. And it's probably the biggest learning that I take out of that is that sometimes there isn't a linear path and we get so caught up in that that we forget that there's off ramps all over the place that are going to take us into various various ways. So I actually went to university to be a lawyer. I wrote my LSAT and that was where I was headed. I was headed to law school and that was my what I thought was my passion and my future and my career. I took the proverbial year off. Everybody does to save money for law school and much against my parents' wishes, by the way. I took a job in a development category with a company named ED, called EDS, and they were an IT company, uh, the Division of Information Technology for General Motors at the time. And it was a friend of mine who got me in, and it was literally supposed to be for a year, and I was going to go through this development program, and then I was going to exit and off to law school. And as I started working there, I realized that it was an interesting industry at that time. IT was very different than it is now. This was back in the late 80s. And it was kind of exciting. And I, I stayed around a little bit longer, an extra year. And, and as I started to learn and sort of embed myself in that in the culture of that company, I realized that this could be a career for me. I met a wonderful woman who became my mentor very quickly and is still one of my very best friends. Taught me a lot about how to grow inside that company and she forced me into things that I really had never thought of before and so I started out as you know a technology development person which was really doing coding and things in, in the computer programs in COBOL back in the 80s and she really forced me out of that and, and brought me into the finance department and took me through that and forced me into sales and marketing and, and slowly started to evolved my thinking outside of what I was actually doing on the technology side. Um, fast forward the clock 22 years, I was still there in various capacities when Hewlett Packard acquired the company. Um, and I took on an executive role there, continued my executive role into Hewlett Packard and retired there. So 28 year career in the IT industry that I never thought I would ever have. So when I retired, I was feeling a little bit exhausted that with the job that I had, I was running operations for Canada for Hewlett Packard, and I was traveling a lot internationally and nationally. I was living in airports and lounges and hotel rooms and was pretty burnt out and, and wanted really to get back to health and wellness. And that's um, that was where I was headed. I, I wasn't sure I was going to work again. I was quite happy being retired. Um, but I ran into Copper Branch at, at an incidental trade show that my husband and I happened to wander into. And I just fell in love with the concept, the thought of bringing something healthy and to our conversation earlier to my community, not to downtown. I didn't want to commute into a big city. So I opened the very first one in Ontario in uh, a little town of Brooklyn, which is just north of Whitby, Ontario. And everybody thought I was absolutely crazy to put a vegan restaurant in such a small community <laughs> and it just went crazy it was so, it was so much fun and I realized that all the skills that I gained in the fortune 500 company were transferable in, in some way into entrepreneurship and that's that's what I started to to do and I just fell in love with the brand I love that hearing you know when you're in school especially going to something as law school because in one right to continue on or to even um to pursue that path you do have to have a degree of seriousness to mm -hmm. it 
and to be able to transition to something else that sounds scary but it almost sounds like it just felt like the right thing to do but then even then again after you had finished your long career with in this type of space to then you know take on a new journey so to say I think that's pretty exciting and I think it is inspiring to show that you don't have to have a set path and it, even your five term year goals they might not actually be what you really need in the moment. It's so true. In fact, one of the things that I always say to people now, if they ask, you know, about career and, and things like that, I, I do a lot of mentoring in, in female leadership. And one of the things I say is just say yes a lot. Say yes to yourself, say yes to people, say yes to opportunities, because most times you will find yourself in a situation where you'll either meet somebody incredible or you'll find something incredible and it's it's nothing that you thought it was going to be and you know my saying yes to opening a franchise with little, little to no restaurant experience thankfully my husband did have some um, but I had absolutely none and it was really scary the first year was really scary and I, I questioned myself a lot during that time to say what have I done I don't know how to do this I'm not an entrepreneur I've, I've always been in a large corporation and and then when I just sat back and relaxed and, and used the importance of you know my work ethic which obviously is a very important thing and just being passionate and, and having a um, a need for just continued results and it just naturally started to work for me and and but it was some there were some bumpy scary times in the first year it's a very lonely feeling to go from working in a large corporation where you're part of a team and part of a big community of leadership to it's all you the buck stops at you the mistakes are yours uh the money is yours the everything belongs to you in the end and and it can sometimes feel very lonely but it certainly sometimes feels very gratifying too when, when great things start to happen. Is there anything that you did when you were in these moments of, you know, being scared to know the debate between keep on going and give up? Because sometimes sometimes things aren't really well suited for us, but then other times it's just us getting over our fear of ourselves. Was there anything that you did that really kept you going in those hard times? learned and learned and learned. I would go on to podcasts. I would go on to, I'm a huge Simon Sinek fan. I listened to all of his stuff. And when I started to feel down or I started to feel like, you know, I was going to fail, I would reach out to the people that I thought were the most influential in the space that I was in. And I would just listen to what they had to say, listen to what they had to do. And I do that to this day. I'm a huge advocate of constant learning. And we can never, we don't know what paths our careers are going to take. We might think we're on a single path and, and that one event in our life might take us a different direction. And if it takes us a different direction and we continue to be inquisitive and, and learn, that maybe we may find our, our passion. Even for me, Copper Branch in the franchise, I knew I wanted to do something healthy. I was not vegan at the time. Um, I just knew I, I needed to take care of myself after a long career of travel. But the two things married together. I started to use my business skills in entrepreneurship, but I also started to realize that as I reached out to my community and started to evolve my network in, in small business and joined my local chamber of commerce and started meeting amazing small business people, I started to find like-minded businesses and it's very natural in the plant-based space to, to come together. It's one of the few, I think, industries where competition really is much more cooperative than it is in any other industry because we all share a common theme, which is we're the underdog trying to change the world. And we have very common values in, in terms of you know, environmental sustainability and animal health and welfare. And so generally we're, we're kind of all following a similar value system and so it does become very easy and and as I reached out to these people my whole world started changing and I started realizing that I actually found my passion which was <laughs> oh god I was only in my 50s that's amazing but I always stressed about that because I, I knew I didn't follow the path of my schooling and I, I 
questioned myself a lot as to did I do the wrong thing staying with with HP as long as I did and it never felt like my passion it felt like a lot of good opportunity and it was an incredible career for me but it never really felt like my passion and I felt sometimes a little bit like a failure because all these people around me I would watch people talk about you know pursuing your passion and the five things to do to to make your business grow and and I realized that none of that means anything really I mean if you start getting caught up in those things you start to feel like you're behind and it's if you just follow your natural organic thinking you'll get there that's good advice because I can even imagine as someone who's still in school the thought of going out of something that wasn't related to my degree program that would be that would almost feel like I, I say this in the way how do I want to put this to me in one way you could look at someone who's who's changed from their degree programs and I, I could see someone thinking how they put so many years into it that that's that's a failure for them but then on the other hand if you're not really enjoying what you're doing or if it doesn't feel right in the moment that that's a failure to yourself in the sense that you're not doing what gives you energy at the end of the day because your career really should keep you going so I just again find your story inspiring just to hear that you know you broke out of the mold of what you were doing and you found success and it sounds as though you've really found happiness in what you're doing very much so and and it wasn't strategic and it wasn't really well planned out. Unfortunately, I don't have that great story to tell. And some people do. Some people naturally just are very regimented in, in their programs and their thinking and they happen to find what they're meant to do. But I think more of us are are not there. We feel pressured to, but we never really find it. And then we feel like we've maybe failed. And regardless of even at HP in the early days, I kind of knew it wasn't really my passion and I knew that I wasn't waking up every day dying to go to work but it also served a great time for me at that moment when I was starting a young family and it was a very evolving industry very exciting industry and it was a well-paying industry and and so it served a purpose as well and I think sometimes we get so wrapped up with you know there has to be this perfect job that drives our hearts and souls and you know we feel so comfortable going to that job every day and sometimes it's it's a means to a, an end to another place that you're going to land and sometimes it takes patience and we have to we have to manage our way through that front end before we get to where we we can make some riskier choices again another thing that you pointed out that pops out is having that idea that this one job should be everything and it should be the whole you get every value that you need in your life and i think that a test that we should also have things outside of the scope of just our jobs to give the support in that that need of success not success but that stability in the other parts of our lives that we're not just like a one person one job that's where everything should derive from and nor should it be you know you can get that happiness with friends and family and that and in of course sometimes when you have a family even you know bringing an income is a very important part if you want to support that other half of your life but I actually do want to shift our conversation in a general sense. Could you talk about maybe what you do, your day-to-day -day activities or some of the major duties that you have? I think it'd be really interesting. Yeah, sure. I mean, unfortunately, I, I've taken the reins of CEO in the middle of a global pandemic. So I think <laughs> one of the things that, uh, that you would typically do as a CEO, I, I don't have the luxury of doing right now because I'm in a bit of firefighting mode and particularly because the restaurant industry has been one of the hardest hit through this whole thing. But one of the luxuries obviously I have as well is that I'm part of a private company. So I don't have a bank of shareholders and stakeholders that I have to report to. We're a pretty small team. And so we, we work pretty synergistically on what needs to be done in the moment. My job really is to set the long-term strategy for Copper Branch and really to balance the health of the company with the health and happiness and profitability of the franchisees. So that is a very different role for a franchisor CEO because you're you're not running a team of extensions of your own. You're you're literally running a series of independent entrepreneurs as part of your team and creating a common agenda for them 
and ensuring that they see a vision and see the vision that I have and get their engagement is really a challenge. It's probably one of the biggest challenges of being a CEO of a franchise is that you've got a lot of different mindsets, a lot of different agendas at play, a lot of different backgrounds and personality traits. And so really as a CEO, if you can, if you can really make decisions quickly and you can get instill the confidence in these franchisees that you're making decisions that impact their small business in a meaningful way, that's when you know you, you've done the right thing. So part of being in the plant-based space is adapting very proactively. So looking at, you know, like we've never, this kind of situation we're in right now is not in the playbook. So <laughs> regardless of what your, your long-term strategy looked like going into this or your vision and your mission, it really didn't matter. You had to pivot and change and, and make things happen. And so we brought the, the franchisees in on that very, very early. We started daily calls, daily health calls, just to ensure that, you know, people mentally were feeling solid. And the fear factor for people just was the biggest it's ever been. I, they were looking at, you know, taking their revenue down 60% in, in a matter of three months. And they were terrified, quite frankly, of what to do. And so we tried to create a, a set of calls every day that we could join that would allow people to ask questions, that would allow people to just open up their fears and, and share best practices and share some things that we were doing in our communities to help stay relevant. And so I think as the CEO in that scenario, it's about engagement and it's about really bringing together enough of a, a mission or revised mission to the franchise community that they believe in. So if people start to see results and they start to see that the actions that you're taking through the setbacks that they're experiencing are helping, they'll start to naturally come with you. And that's the most important thing to me as, as a CEO is to have people believe in what you've set. You can set strategic goals, set, set out your five-year plan and your 10-year plan. And if nobody believes in what you believe in, it won't happen and you won't make it. So I think that's one of the biggest learnings for me in, in coming into this role was how to manage this diverse team of franchisees and how to bring everybody to a common agenda. Really what most fun part of my job is engaging and networking with other thought leaders in the space. So you've probably seen it in the areas of study that you're in, the amount of innovation and change that's happening in the plant-based sector right now also has with it some absolutely incredible executive leaders, leadership. And I've managed to and, and been fortunate enough to spend time with some of these innovators. And it's just incredible to watch what they're doing and, and with the, the conviction that they have to bring these products to market. And for us to be able to become a, a small little incubation hub for them is absolutely Probably uh, definitely the most fun part of my of my job today. So we're working with companies like Sweets from the Earth, Field Rose, Just Egg, Very Good Butcher, some of these great innovators. And part of what we've put in our strategy is to really, as a Canadian company, seek out these Canadian innovators and help them grow their business and help them bring their products to market. Wow, that is so cool <laughs> what you're doing and to. There's so many different things involved in, you know, before I'm sounding like, I don't know how you manage it all, but at the same time, it just sounds as though you're really just doing a people job where, you know, you're connecting with your franchisees owners and like you said, making sure that they're okay, because that's another thing that you point out as that I was just thinking while you were talking about this with the franchisees owners, as a consumer, what we see is we just see the brand. And we just see this is the location for that. But sometimes we kind of forget that there's the middleman or that, that franchisee order. And they're going to have maybe a completely different background than someone who's in another city who's owning the same franchise at a different location. So for you to be able to talk and do all those types of things, it's, I don't know, it just sounds like really exciting. And, and I could see why you enjoy doing that. Yeah, it's it's really fun. It can be very stressful as well because mm -hmm. sometimes you're taking on the the pain of some of these people especially during this pandemic where you're you're watching some franchisees thrive and you're watching others 
really deteriorate and on no merit of their own. It's nothing that they're doing. It's it's by pure location. So our stores, you know, that are located in the base of uh, Bay Street in Toronto, where they're in the financial district, that has just been decimated. There are no companies going into those office towers. And so these businesses went from thriving regular customers to shutting down temporarily because there's just no traffic. And it's devastating to watch that because you know that they're wonderful entrepreneurs. They're, they're wonderful brand ambassadors. They were running an incredible business before this happened. And, and now you just watch them feel so defeated. And it's that part of it's really challenging to, uh, to watch. And, and I try as much as I can to be empathetic to that. And because I was also, and still am a franchisee, I do have a, a little more empathy for how they're feeling day to day because I know what it's like to be doing what they're doing. So Godspeed, this will be over soon and mm -hmm. uh, get back to, to executing strategy. I'm in downtown Toronto, so I know exactly where you're talking about and the foot traffic difference. Uh, I can't even get over the difference between and it's vacant and it's kind of, kind of scary. <laughs> yeah, but, no, it's it's hard. I do think the good thing coming out of COVID is that people are starting to make a connection between their food and their health. And I think I talk to more people now that are, they're actually making a conscious connection between what they're eating and what it might mean to the world. So it's, that has, I've never seen that before. Usually people just eat to feel good. Some people will eat to, to sort of stay healthy. Not very often do you see people make a connection between I'm looking at this product and I'm thinking about its sustainability and I'm thinking about whether it, you know, is using factory farming. I'm thinking about whether it's using non-regenerative agriculture and, and people are actually thinking that way now. And, and I think some of that is in thanks to, to COVID and how this all started. And so maybe it was just an evolution, evolutional push that we all needed to, uh, to start to think differently. Yeah, I'm, I'll take it with that as well, thinking of it in a positive light. I, I do hope with everything that's come that there'll be a real, I mean, it's hard. I couldn't imagine not seeing a real dynamic shift in everything. So yeah. I, I, I'm with you. I, I want to see more of that. So actually, one of the things that you had also mentioned is that you're also a franchisee owner. And I know that that was your role prior to, you know, being a CEO, but I just wanted to know a little bit more about what that job entails and what's it like? That's kind of, I mean, to me, I, I loved what you said earlier and that you picked up on sometimes the chains and I wouldn't call us a big chain, but we, we get lumped into that category in, in many ways. We forget that the face behind that store is still an entrepreneur and a person that's risked their, their own financial money. And, and I think the average consumer just doesn't see that. They, they don't see the difference between corporate stores like a Starbucks structure and entrepreneurs and franchisees in a different structure. So thank you for pointing that out. But as a franchise owner, it's really, you're just a microcosm of a large corporation, except you're accountable for everything, <laughs> good and bad. <laughs> That's the way I always look at it, because at least at HP, you know, if we made a mistake, we made it together. And we usually made it as a team of sales and marketing, operations, finance. You know, all of us were in it together. And and we accepted the great sales that we made. And, and we accepted the down years that we didn't hit our targets. And But there was this sense of community and sense of unity that as a, as a franchisee, you know, if you have amazing staff, you get a little bit of that. But still always the buck stops at you. And the marketing decisions you make and the financial analysis that you have to do to keep your cash flow current. Those are all things that are on you as a franchisee every single day. And your HR decisions that you make and how you execute your business plan, those are all things that, you know, even though you're part of a bigger franchise community, everybody's journey on this on this franchise route is different because you you're executing to a different set of demographics regardless of how common we might set the plans for how we set up a store, what the menu looks like and what the recipes look like. There's still always variances of that to every single store that you go into. So you're just a, you're a mini, mini corporation basically is, is what you are and, and you hold a lot of responsibility. That's really interesting. And 
just so I get a better grasp as, as well as the listeners. So, for example, you know, different regions have different menu items. I how do how would something like that go about? It would it be like a maybe if the franchise fran, franchisee owner, pardon me, <laughs> had an idea for a menu item, would they just create it? Go to the no. head? How would that go? So there is a very there's a common menu across Copper Branch and a common set of recipes across Copper Branch. What we try to do is we try to for in our France stores as an example. There's some very unique things to the French culture that they're looking for in their food. And so our master franchise, master franchisor, which is the business model we run under, will come to us with variations in some of the products that we provide. So, for instance, in the French market, they have croissants on their menu, vegan croissants. So we don't have that in our North American menu. It just doesn't make sense for us, but it makes a lot of sense for brands. So we're... We're relatively flexible in listening to our franchisees and what they have to say. Uh, we have some exciting products that we're working on in development right now for our Maritimes locations. We have a store in New Brunswick and uh, Nova Scotia. And of course, for them, it's seafood. And are there ways that we can work with? We're having discussions with Good Catch right now on developing some products for that particular market that may make its way into North America in general, mm -hmm. but it may be something we might do specifically for that store. So I would say 98% of our menu is core across all locations. And then we try to keep that little bit of fluidity so that we can be relevant in, in the markets that we need to be. Oh, okay, that makes more sense. And hearing, and it just gets me thinking even more. It's just so exciting that, you know, again, you're in the vegan space. So, you know, you can't just fish a lobster out of the, the, the water and, you know, put it on your menu. So you have to think of alternatives that still get the people who are conventionally maybe meat eaters to, to go for and be excited about. So that's, I could see why every day would be exciting for you in that respect as well. For sure. And, and it's, it's easy because the, the food innovators, um, that's why for being in food science right now, it would just be, if I could do it all over again, that would probably be the path that I would take because it's, it's incredible to watch what they're doing. I mean, we're, they're developing steaks and Petri dishes right now. I know. Um, it's, it's it, crazy. It, it, it's uh, so for us, finding alternative sources of protein, we work with so many great companies to do that. And then what happens for us is we have a corporate chef who has to look at a lot of different variables. So it's easy to say, you know, here's the greatest protein as an example, let's use uh, Impossible or Beyond Meat as a product. Well, that didn't fit in our concept at the time that they came out because it was, it didn't have the ingredients and nutritionals to pass our, mm -hmm. our us for that. The availability and distribution is always a factor for us as well, because we have to think international and how much of our existing equipment and existing SKUs could we utilize when we introduce that product? So there's a lot of things the corporate chef has to look at before he goes, wow, that's a great product. Let's just bring it in. You know, we have to vet it through a lot of different things, but we look at you know, some of the great things in dairy and great things in protein that are happening. And then we vet it against what we expect and what our minimum amount uh, threshold is for nutritionals. And then we'll, we'll work on whether it fits into our menu, whether it fits into our 12 month plan, because we have a 12 month menu development plan that we fall through. So we know every quarter we're going to introduce some new limited time offer. And we try to ensure that, that those limited time offers are where we're bringing in and testing those exciting new products and, and then collecting our, our consumer feedback on those products to decide whether that limited time offer makes a permanent a spot on our menu and displaces something or whether it just comes back again next year in that same quarter that it would come in so if it's an easter type thing then we would bring it in maybe again the following easter that's so cool and again you you had mentioned that it has to pass your nutritional standards and i think that's i just want to point out i just think that's really cool <laughs> it's hard it's really hard because when you when you balance the strategy for copper branch is you know, nourishing our community with whole food plant-based and our tagline's good for you, good for the planet. So when, when that's your tagline, you have to stay true to that. And it's so tempting to bring in some of these highly processed soy products that are delicious, that are, you know, they appeal to the flexitarian, they appeal to the non-vegan, 
and they're simple. You just throw them in. I mean, you see what KFC is doing with the chicken sandwich, and it's just easy to do. But for us, it's a little more challenging because we've got this good for you, good for your planet tagline, and it hits the good for the planet part, but we fall short on the nutritional. So we're very cautious on the processed food that's being introduced into plant-based right now and, and to make sure that we're not too heavy on that side. That's that's really cool. And I just want to bring it back because the, the podcast is meant a lot for students and new graduates. And I just thought it would be interesting just to ask if for something like, uh, is there room to grow in quick serve food restaurants such as, I say, pardon me, I shouldn't say quick serve because you said fast casual, um, pardon me. But um, if someone was to begin at the front of the house, would they have the opportunity to maybe build their career up and become a franchisee owner? And if they did, is there skills that you would be looking out for? Yeah, I mean, I can tell you what I look for in my own staff, and I have an incredible team of people. I've been so fortunate. Some young people that are you know, just either very committed to the cause, which is natural for Copper Branch. We stand it a little differently for people that want to work for us because they believe in what we're doing. Um, so it's it's always nice to have those employees that, that believe in our mission because they naturally seek out ways to grow. Um, but I would say, you know, explore ways to make a connection between what it is you do every day for that company. So if you're the cashier on the front uh, counter, find ways to explore how to augment that into something meaningful for the company. So, you know, if well, I'll give you a great example. We had a young 17 year old boy in our Brooklyn location who ended up staying with us all the way through high school and, and we lost him when he went to university. Um, and he was so inquisitive. And he always wanted to know, how do you calculate food cost? And how do you decide what comes on the menu and how? So I taught him because he wanted to learn and I showed him how to calculate food cost. And so one day I came in and he was putting together a brand new menu item on his own. And it was a it was a bean burrito. I'll never forget it. And he said, what do you think of this? Trish, this look, doesn't this look amazing? And, you know, taste it and everything. And I said, that's great, Cam. What do you think the food cost is? And he said, oh, I don't know. And I said, well, let's work it out. So we went through the exercise of calculating the food cost. And I asked him to tell me what would the price of that sandwich look like to the customer? And what do you think that means? So we walked through. We had a real life experience on how to, you know, would a customer pay that much for that sandwich? Can we afford to put that extra bit of cheese on there? Or should we cut back on the cheese? Should we add more beans? Should we? And it, it just became this learning moment. And I realized that he was not going to probably grow his career in the food industry, but he was going to grow his career somewhere because he was so inquisitive to, to connect what he was doing every day with what the outcome of the company was. And that would be my, my biggest advice to people in the food industry. If they have a, a passion for, for food and passion for that industry, think about all the different ways you can use that. Because if you... There are many, many lucrative careers in the food industry in franchise sales and being a franchisee and being an executive on the operations team and growing your way up through that. So the minute you, you disconnect, just if you're making a sandwich and that's your job, if, if that's all you think about every day and you don't try to grow that into something meaningful, you'll never find that path to where that, that career will take you. So there's not always a... I never create a linear path to you, know, you start here and then you go here and then you go here and then you go here. I say you start here. And if if you're a huge thinker and, and an inquisitive person and you say yes a lot and you're authentic and you don't take yourself too seriously and you have a good work ethic, you will find your way through that chain faster than anybody who studies the linear path of how to get there. I think that's great advice. And I think I got to not take myself so seriously. Maybe that's where I'm falling short. <laughs> I, hard um, not to. We all do it. It's hard I, not to. It really is. Oh, and you get so set on a way. You just, it feels like, and it really shouldn't be. It feels like the end of the world when it really shouldn't be. But it's something I need to learn on my journey. So. <laughs> oh, we all have to learn it. It's for sure. I think it's just. The biggest one is saying yes. Honestly, I go back to that because mm -hmm. 
so easy for us to say, no, that doesn't fit in my in my job description or no, that that's not what I'm supposed to be doing or no. Just do it. Try it and, and watch where it takes you. It's incredible. It's definitely good advice. And I love the idea of being physical about things and it's such an easy way to show that you're interested and I mean you have nothing really to lose if anything you only have something to gain so just ask questions it's it's so simple and people if you do it the right way people would be glad to help I think in many occasions yeah I mean as a leader the best thing that ever happens to you is to have somebody come and tell you what they want there's nothing better than somebody that's on the front line saying I want to own a franchise one day. The minute they put that out there and they share that with you, that's in my head now to know that that person, that's what they're thinking. So we do a lot of th things in our community where we'll, um, we'll work at farm sanctuaries and we'll work at yoga studios and we'll bring, you know, we'll do pop-ups in various different locations. And we try to really get involved in our communities. And those will be the people I'll go to because I know that they're thinking way beyond the job they're doing that day for me they're inquisitive and they want to learn. So now that they've told me what they want to do, I'm, I've got something I can do to help them. And, and people want to be helpful. Leaders want to be helpful. And it's, it's sometimes reinforces a leader's confidence to, to know that they can actually do something for the people that work for them. So sharing your wants and your needs and your wildest crazy idea of <laughs> where you'd like to take things will sometimes be the biggest gift you can give to your leader because they can actually make change happen that's you know what i think that's like you've said it well and i want i'm going to leave it there because we are coming to the end of this conversation which it has blown by i don't even know how it's at this point so because you've actually hit on a lot of notes i actually had two questions left and I know we've touched upon it, but the first one is, why is the industry that you work in a great place to work? I think because you can affect so many different things. You can affect people's health and people's health transformations. You can help the world. I mean, there's nothing more satisfying than, than reading the stats that are coming out on what plant-based is doing to, to the world carbon footprint. I mean, that's just absolutely gratifying in watching that. And the change and in innovation that's happening, the pace of change that even watching through COVID, this industry pivot itself into curbside, dining and takeout delivery. It's incredible. And it's, it's an industry that affects everybody at a common level. And sometimes when you're in a career like HP and you try to explain to your grandma or your kids what you do, they're looking at you like, what? I don't know. <laughs> really hard right well I do this so you know I sell big deals to big you know, and they, they just scratch their head and well, okay well you have a job um, <laughs> but in the restaurant industry it's like you make amazing food that has an impact on the planet that's changing people's health that's reversing the type 2 diabetes for people and these are amazing amazing things that resonate with every single person and it's so easy to talk about what you do because Everybody knows what the restaurant is and to, to just take it to the next level of a plant-based restaurant just adds another element of how it impacts the world. And it's, it's just an, such an exciting time to be in, in this particular sector. It is. It's amazing just how much it's grown in 10 years. I remember having these conversations about the role in the environment in what you eat with 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 some of my classmates long it wasn't it didn't it wasn't even that long ago and to see where we've come and just the explosion and having places like where you are these restaurants picking up on this and making the change and going for it it's just it's so exciting <laughs> it is and even in the packaging side like I, I'd be remiss not to to miss out on that part of it like just compostable materials that are being used for for takeout and, you know, watching plastic be banned as an example. And Copper Branch, years before that happened, had changed to corn-based straws and and at a cost. I mean, that's not an inexpensive thing. So that's another whole business aspect to the restaurant industry is how do we evolve our thinking in, in the materials that we're using in environmental consciousness and still remain competitively priced. I mean, it kills me to watch the McDonald's drive through lineups with you know 50 cars in them and I think they still haven't converted from plastic straws because they I said know. it would take them this much longer to, and it just makes me 
ill because I look at, at Copper Branch and I think the financial pressure we put on our food costs by introducing those expensive compostable elements as a, you know, conscious environmental corporation. And yet these large corporations that, you know, have a lot more resources than we do don't make their way to that path as quickly. And I'm seeing that change and I'm seeing that there's a lot more pressure on, on all restaurants to change. And so that's another whole element of, of the restaurant industry that's pretty exciting and pretty transformational too. Mm-hmm. Well, I know for me, I know what I'll uh, be picking up this weekend. Um, <laughs> there's a location that's near me, which is great. And I can't wait to be able to go and just sit outside on the patio or just like, go sit outside and just enjoy the food. So, or sit in the restaurant. Oh, I just can't wait. <laughs> well, there's a brand new one in Toronto one in Canary District that could really use anybody's business right now. They opened right during COVID. It's an absolutely beautiful store with a beautiful patio. And I just can't wait for them to hit spring because they opened <laughs> literally in the middle of the uh of the pandemic last november so if anyone wow. listening and anyone lives near the canary district please go visit my friend vanessa our franchisee and and help her out well if it's within um my commuting difference i will definitely be having a look out on that and yes everyone go go check them out they, they, they <laughs> definitely want your support <laughs> that's amazing well thanks veronica and I just got, before you go, I just want to make sure if people want to find or connect with you, where can they find you? Absolutely. I am very connectable. Um, Trish at eatcopperbranch.com. I give my email out to customers, employees. doesn't matter who it is. I love to hear from people. So Trish at eatcopperbranch.com. Excellent. And I'll make sure to link that in the show notes so everyone can connect if they feel need to. So overall, thank you so much for being on the show. That was a great conversation and it's such an exciting space. And I'm so happy that you came on the show and just explained so many different aspects of the industry that are frankly, really still new to me. Oh, that's amazing. Well, you're on for a very exciting career as a food scientist. I think that's an incredible role for you and I'm I'm excited for the future. And thank you so much for taking the time to, to talk to me. That was episode 18 of the Food Grads podcast. All the notes to this podcast can be found on the Food Grads website by clicking the podcast tab on the homepage. There you can find any notes to past or future episodes. Before you go, if you have a chance, check out Copper Ranch. I did end up going to the location near me and the food was awesome. I recommend the Aristotle Power Bowl. I'm not usually a fan of beets, but it worked really well in the bowl. Not to mention, everything tastes really fresh. So I'm quite happy to know there is a restaurant like this near me, so you guys should check it out. Anyways, that's it for the podcast. Thank you everyone so much for listening. I'll see you next week.